so the thing I would really like to look at today is, is basically um, the nature slash the function of the, adapt, of the unconscious. And mm -hmm. the, the frame I'm trying to look through right now is this frame of the adaptive unconscious. But mm -hmm. I would really like to see how does that connect and distinguish from unconscious as long-term memory, unconscious as mm -hmm. the computer, because I also looked mm -hmm. at the computer again, which I think is a, is a very limited understanding of unconscious processes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I would really like to look at like, what is the, the function, the nature and the extent of the unconscious? Because um, I think depending on how we look at it, we will get very different pictures of what is it actually able to do? What role does it play in our life? And also how to relate to it. So just to give you an example, like, um, mm -hmm. like uh, the, the chimp model looks at the computer as it's just what you've stored in it and it just mm -hmm. automatically comes out. I think that's a very, very limited understanding of the computer, which mm -hmm. um, from how I understand it actually has incredible learning capacities. Like mm -hmm. the unconscious learns things on its own and it actually mm -hmm. learns things that are sometimes way too complex for consciousness to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And this learning and this ability to distinguish patterns and to, to, uh, to react to them creatively, I would actually have as part of the unconscious. So thinking that is a different picture than having the idea of, oh, it's a storage for past things that the chimp or the human have put into it and it just automatically happens. Mm. Like, so I, I do think that this idea of what is the actual function and what is the extent of capacities that the unconscious has is actually a very interesting questions question that i think can open up discussion yes uh first thing i want to say is i want to be very um uh what's the word for this uh the the not nice word for this is anal <laughs> what's the what's the normal technical word for being anal there's a word for it Precise. um uh i think it's also with a p but i can't remember anyway I, I just want to pick apart a, a specific sentence that you said in all of that. Uh, just very to be very careful with wording, Go for uh, it. basically, which is that you said um, that the unconscious can learn things which even the conscious is not capable of learning. Mm -hmm. So I just um, I, I think I know what you were saying, what you intended, but I want to be really, really super clear about it. So what, how I would have put it or how I would, how I imagine what you mean by that statement is something like, um, uh, you can learn things without conscious, without a conscious awareness of the fact that you're learning those things. Sometimes the things that you, sometimes things that you learn that are very complex, uh, it's actually better to learn without conscious awareness or your conscious awareness isn't going to be particularly helpful in learning them. The reason why I wanted to rephrase it is because, uh, when you said you, uh, a sentence like your conscious cannot learn it or, or something like that. Um, I still, even though I, I agree that um, the idea of the computer that as, as presented in the chimp model is uh, limited. Um, I think it's, you know, it's not terrible that it's limited because the idea of having a simple model is so that we can extract much power without too much work. But still, I also agree that, you know, we can go more, ask more questions about it and discover that it's more complicated than just the way that it's presented. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will help us get a better understanding. So I do, I do believe that as well. Um, but I still, I still think that one, one thing that I, uh, I don't question or I still think is valid. Um, although I mean, maybe you'll disagree with me is that uh, essentially all learning does end up changing that part that we call the adaptive unconscious. That's the bit mm -hmm. that changes whether it's something that you're focusing on that you're learning because of your uh, focus attention or whether it's something that you're learning sort of quote unquote by osmosis, you know, you're not, uh, it's, some, it's somehow happening without your conscious awareness, whether it's one or the other, what ultimately changes is your adaptive unconscious. 
which would have been called the computer in uh, in Steve Peters' work. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I I agree with that, and that word that sentence was maybe not the most anal <laughs> um, <laughs> way of putting it or the most um, pedantic that's the word I wanted I just can't think of pedantic, it. pedantic. yeah oh. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And immediately <laughs> yeah. my computer or my account just immediately comes up with a quote from family guy where nah, shallow and pedantic um, uh, yeah. but yeah the, I was pointing to a certain certain capacity to learn that mm. um that is i think inherently connected to our un unconscious yes which, which is about on one level just the sheer amount of data it can take in and tries to make sense of that is mm. way beyond the amount of data that our consciousness can even try to hold and make sense of just um, the, I mean, there are these numbers, and I'm, and I'm not even sure how they come up with these numbers, but of like, oh, the unconscious can hold 11 million bits of information each second, whereas consciousness can hold 40. I'm like, well, how have you measured that? I don't know. But if mm -hmm. it's anywhere in that ballpark, that's a pretty big difference <laughs> of yeah. having how much, how much information does each system process at once. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the second thing that I wanted to say is when I thought about, you know, because we spoke about uh, having this conversation a few days ago, about a week ago, and, and uh, that it was going to be about the adaptive unconscious. And what came to mind for me is that basically there are a bunch of, you know, what, what can I do to make this conversation uh, more interesting or to have, um, to, to provide the best, uh, best fuel for it? best interesting ideas into it is to think of all the things that I know that concern the adaptive unconscious and just throw them all in because a lot of the time it's like um, uh, authors won't specifically make a connection to say and this is part of something called the adaptive unconscious or anything like that you know they won't say that but effectively when you think about it that's it's got to be it's got to be connected to it somehow mm -hmm. so like so, some of the ideas are um, so there's a difference uh, between uh, learning mechanical or physical skills versus um, other types of learning. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a wide literature on it and I'm not that familiar with it, but a, a sort of relatively casual piece of literature about this is called The Inner Game of Tennis, um, which talks about how basically you need to stop thinking about things and you need to just let your body do it in order to learn tennis. And it's been applied to other sports and other things as well. So partly it's a question of, um, uh, as far as I understand, the, uh, there, there are parts of your brain that are involved in things like motion, which are very large and not really very well connected to parts that are more associated with uh, sort of uh, conscious processing. So um, if, you, if you do too much conscious processing, if you, if you do too much like heavy thinking, when you're trying to hit a tennis ball, it's probably not going to help your 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 swing your tennis um so that's that's one aspect of of learning using the adapt what, what i would say that fits into the adaptive unconscious that you know that this is your your body's effectively learning to do something and you're trying to get out of the way um that's like saying your consciousness is, is a problem in in that scenario and really you just want to do it unconsciously as far as possible um so that's one thing i throw in another thing i throw in is um all of the different aspects of heuristics and biases um, you know, they're quite universal and they are definitely something that is related to the adaptive unconscious. So heuristics and biases as a whole and all their different parts, it's part of that. Um, and then I would say things to do with priming. Uh, so priming is basically where um, people are subjected to a stimulus, often one they're not um, supposed to see as relevant, but it changes their behavior. So for example, people who are exposed to uh, words associated with old people, uh, res as a result, end up walking slower uh, in the subsequent, you know, 30 minutes or an hour or something. Um, so that, that, and they're not aware of the fact that there should be any connection. But uh, compared to that, are, to there are so many beautiful examples on priming. Yeah, like there is, 
there are examples on people having doing studies where they're supposed to guess oh how many people do this and how many people do that so they're supposed to guess numbers and mm. depending on the number they are assigned as for the study like if they are participant number five or participant number 1023 mm -hmm. they will guess lower or higher numbers yeah so that's anchoring yeah. that's also that that's that's covered also in um uh, daniel kahneman's uh work as well yeah but i guess that is kind of basically that's a form of priming yeah yeah um so um then uh yeah and then i would add um something that i've looked at a bit is something called uh stereotype threat which is a bit which is another kind of priming essentially um to do with fulfilling stereotypes about groups that you belong to when you're reminded semi-subconsciously that you are a member of that group um, often applies to things like um, if you remind people of their gender they tend to perform uh, better or typically worse um, or at tasks they're not supposed to be good at according to their cultural stereotype uh, that's one example um, and then something called self-affirmation theory which is a also subconscious cure to this subconscious problem <laughs> very interesting it's to do with um to do with nature of it, it actually reveals some ideas as to how stereotype threat works um because it talks about how you you uh, by having multiple perspectives on your own self on who you are as a person then it protects you against stereotype threat so if for example you re you remind someone that they're a girl but you also remind them that they're a hockey player um, and they are a, uh, I don't know, a conservative or something, uh, and they are a, whatever else, right? Um, they are a sister to someone, right? If you rem remind them that they're all these things, then um, then what happens is that they uh, they actually ha are shielded from the effects of of, the, of of you know told that you're a girl, and therefore they do, for example, worse on a maths test because they live in a culture which expects meant to perform better in maths tests. So, um, so that's another example then uh, uh, mm -hmm. called self-affirmation theory. Um, there might be some others that jump, jump into my head as, as we go on. Um, oh yeah, sorry, there are, right, right now. Okay, I just thought some more. <laughs> uh, so one of, one of them is um, uh, percolation and uh, incubation. And I often, I, at the moment, I can't remember quite what the difference between these two things are, but they're to do with creativity. When people come up with new ideas, um, often it's a, as a result of the ideas kind of sitting and stewing in their mind over a long time, often without their actual thought. So this is something where they're not actually consciously deliberating, but something's happening where they have an idea in the bath, right? And it's because the, all these ideas were in their head Sort of roughly at the same time but they weren't really thinking about it and they go to sleep and they wake up in the middle of the night and they have an idea or they have a bath and they have an idea you know th this kind of thing this is as a result of something called incubation. they take a dump and they have an idea right wow. it's, it's, a, it's a, exactly it's at the moment moments where you don't expect it to happen right <laughs> where yeah. you're, you're relaxing and you have nothing on your mind <laughs> so um uh so yeah there's there's uh there's, there's that uh and then there's the um uh, the DMN, the default mode network, which is a neurology thing, not a cognitive science thing, but um, about parts of the brain that are active when you're not really thinking about anything. People with different DMNs have been found to, like basically different bits of their brain that light up when they're not really actually aware of thinking about anything. It, it has been found to correlate with various other things like, um, as far as I understand, um, number, of, number of publications or like level of academic success um, people, uh, researchers who have, have DMNs that are, where they, more of their brain that's related to whatever that subject is. If they're a psychologist, I suppose it would be the part of the brain that is related to thinking about psychology. If you can somehow detect what that is, apparently, I don't know. But uh, I, again, I'm not super, super aware of all of the details of the, of the research here. But basically, you know, if you're at the neurological level, if it's discovered that you're, when you're resting and you're not aware of anything, there's actually some sort of thinking going on in the background within that, then it helps you in your career in that particular example. I'm sure mm -hmm. it can help you in other ways or hinder you in other ways, perhaps. 
So, um, so that's another thing I'd throw in. This is a bit of a kitchen sink thing. I'm just throwing in like 10 different things. But, but I, I enjoy it because actually I prepared a bit of stuff and actually almost everything you're throwing out refers to what I wanted to bring in as really an overview of the adaptive unconscious. Um, so I think we can, we can make a lot of cross connections and I think that could be a very interesting base to then go deeper on. Do you have any more to throw into the kitchen sink right now? <laughs> uh, nothing comes to mind. It might though. So if, if anything it else... It might be that as you, as you stop talking, it will just come up. That it will just come up. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it just come up out of nowhere. Goodness knows where that came from. Yeah, quite possible. But at the moment, that's, that's already quite a few, and I'm sure you've got your own ones. Yeah, because what I try to do is I'm, I'm going through the, the book again right now. Let's see if mm -hmm. this works. Boom shakalaka. Um, because I was wanting to really get to this what is the adaptive unconscious according to that book? that's Strangers to Ourself by Timothy Wilson and how he um, defines it. And I just mm -hmm. want to go through it really quickly. Like mm -hmm. his definition of unconscious, which is, I think we can get to that in a moment when we talk about um, maybe the distinction of a short-term memory versus long-term memory being good enough for education. But for mm -hmm. his purposes, that's not the definition he chooses. He calls unconscious our mental processes that are inaccessible to consciousness, but influence our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Mm. And he goes into that as one example of, I can try as much as I want to. I won't become conscious of how my brain and my mind are taking all these bits of information, hitting my retina and turning them mm. into 3d vision. That's uh, mental yeah. processing. And yeah. he then goes into quite a lot of detail of explaining the adaptive unconscious, but he kind of brings it together by saying the adaptive unconscious has the ability to seize up our environments, size up our environments, mm. disambiguate them, interpret them, and then initiate behavior so we can act quickly and effortlessly. That's kind of his mm. um, core definition of what does the adaptive unconscious or our unconscious actually do mm. and for that he's oh, yeah, he says basically it has um f for him five core um functions in that the adaptive unconscious actually learns it filters our environment it then translates this into meaning it creates feelings and emotions as reactions to that. And it then sets goals as to how to act and behave in these environments. Mm. And if you're up for it, I would just take you through that and the examples he gives for that, because they're very close to the stuff you just threw into the kitchen sink, actually. Um, sure. Can we go back to the first slide? Yeah, of course. Boom, boom. So I, um, I think a really important thing to note here, which you've highlighted yourself, is the word processes. Mm -hmm. Because long-term memory and the, the computer, if you like, in the, in the um, chimp model, it has, a, it has a relatively, something of a lack of emphasis on the idea of process. It's basically like the computer is this kind of like this black box, if you will, that serves up serves up answers but you know there has to be some sort of process some sort of process behind that at least if not mm -hmm. other processes going on right so i think processes is really good i really like his, his definition containing that word it's, um it's also if you connect that to long-term memory it then mm -hmm. then it would be less about the content of long-term memory but it would be about the process of long-term memory like how the content is served and all of that and that the content is part of that but that it's bigger than just the oh i have these things in my long-term memory one two three four five um yeah well i mean i i think you might have to make a distinct or well, at least at some level make some distinction between content and process um because presumably there's like a way that this broadly works and that is going to be more or less content independent I imagine, um, and then you know, if different different content 
is is going to have you know much like every person in the world is uh, is is different from every other person but um you know the basic cognitive architecture is usually fundamentally the same uh even though like everyone thinks different things everyone has different uh, opinions and behaviors and and lots of other things are different but the, there's certain fundamental uh things which are uh, uh you know it's inhuman to have a reaction time below one millisecond or something right because of the way that we are right so there are certain things that okay i don't know if that was a good example but there, there are um I, th I think you can you can separate the processes from the content to some extent mm -hmm. and i i do imagine there is a level where processes and content are very much interwoven because certain content I might have learned in the past, like I grew up in war, the world mm. is an unsafe place that will mm. create different intensity of processes within my adaptive unconscious to adapt. But, um, but yeah. I, I was thinking it would be more like the kinds of things where you get into leaving or into sort of uh, kind of t tangling together of, of content and process, I imagine would be more in kind of uh, uh, reflexive uh, content. So content which says something like, I, uh, for example, uh, I shouldn't accept like, or like, you know, I should or I shouldn't, you know, relating to your own thoughts like i i should think about things carefully or something like that um that if you had that thought then it would change the way that you thought about your thoughts you know they were just kind of like a circular thing i think that's something that could like at some level you'd have a tangling of content and process i mean if we if we look at this distinction of um or this definition of mental processes that that are inaccessible to consciousness like oh, even right. if I even if I had the the thought of I should think about this more carefully, I can consciously think about it more carefully. But for mm. instance, the information that's offered to me by my unconscious, how do I control that? How do I make that more careful? And maybe we can return to this definition in a moment when when I've gone through some of the points he makes because I'm trying sure. to kind of map his arguments. So yeah, let's go on to the next bit. Sorry, <laughs> that was that. That was. I, I think we'll. Yeah, I don't. Not sure. If I should have interrupted you. <laughs> no, I mean it's great because I actually like that. Keeping the focus on the processes, mm. and basically these processes are there to size up the environment, disambiguate it, interpret it, and then initiate behavior. And mm. in his, um, in his worlds, the, these are the five things that we do mm. for that. And I want to go through that with examples. So I've tried to create these incredible drawings. So um, one of the processes he really pays a lot of attention to is pattern recognition. So the adaptive unconscious actually takes all the data and tries to recognize patterns in them. And he calls that learning on the level of adaptive unconscious. And one example also coming to, um, I don't know if this is also in Blink, but uh, one example he names is this experiment where people um, were sitting in front of a computer that had four squares and there would be an X appearing on one of them. And they then had to press a button um, to be like, okay, it's in the top square, boop. Um, and then the X would disappear again and it would appear somewhere else. You know, so that was the whole experiment. Now, in this experiment, there was a really complex pattern of, or a really complex algorithm as to where the X would appear next. It wasn't just random, but it was like, um, it had all of these really complex steps. So for instance, if the X was here, then one of the rules was, it would have to appear in two other, um, squares before it reappears and uh, it would only appear like on the same side uh, twice in a row if before that this and this had happened 
So it was these, these really complex rules that we would never figure out consciously, at least not very easily. But what they found out was if people did this experiment for long, they got a lot faster at being able to press the buttons when the X appeared. It's like their unconscious was kind of expecting it to appear there. And to, to test this also as a hypothesis with maybe they just got quicker at pressing buttons and it had nothing to do with people figuring out uh, the algorithm. They then changed the algorithm. They kept the experiment exactly the same, but they changed the underlying rules and people went back to being as slow as they were when they first started the experiment. So something must have learned these rules, but nobody was able to articulate them. And nobody even knew that there were rules. And maybe uh, just the, the thing I love about this, this experiment is it was done with only psychology professors who were interested in implicit and unconscious learning. But none of them said, oh, my unconscious learned these rules because none of them thought there were rules. But they all said things like, oh, there must have been like priming telling me to be slower or my fingers lost their rhythm. Like that was the kind of uh, stuff they, they would have as explanations as to why they suddenly were slower again. Right. And there are lots of things to say about this. About the last point, I mean, it's similar with... Similar with things like apparently statisticians are not much better than the average person at, um, uh, at like uh, um, statistical intuition. Mm -hmm. Like, so that, you know, statisticians are good at calculating statistics, but they're not very good at giving you a rough idea of like, how probable do you think this thing is? If you tell, if you ask people in the population, you ask a statistician, they, they tend to make the same kind of level of error. So it's, it's, there's a funny thing where even if you're a specialist, there are certain ways in which certain situations where it doesn't help you. Um, anyway, but like de definitely some other things I want to say about the experiment. I mean, there's one other slightly comparable, but notably different. Yes. Yeah. Uh, everything. Okay. Yeah. There's one other slightly comparable, but notably also different experiment, which is about um, two packs of cards. One's red and one's blue. And you have to pick up cards uh, in, from whichever pack you like. And if you get the wrong kind of cards, then you lose money. If you get the right kind, you gain money, something like that. And, and it was the, the people taking part in the experiment were not told. refers to that experiment as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. But he refers to it at another point. Um, right. So, so, but it's, I think it's similar that like it's understanding patterns. Yeah. Y yes. I mean, I, I want to highlight one similarity and one difference. So, uh, anyway, I mean, for the people listening, what happened in the experiment was that people could get a sense. Um, people started drawing more from the blue pile than the red pile, even though they were, even though when they were asked, they didn't answer anything like, I think the blue pile's better. They didn't even, they weren't even completely aware. They weren't really aware that they were adopting that strategy. They adopted the strategy before they were aware that, uh, consciously aware that there was something wrong with the red cards because they seemed to come up bad more often. Um, so, Apparently, in, I mean, it might be that they just in, didn't, in, they just felt embarrassed to admit that they were, because people are, you know, if they're doing this on like Americans or, Euro, or Western Europeans even, right, people are supposed to be rational. It's like a, it's like a, a societal norm that you're supposed to only have, do things that you have reasons for, you know, this, yeah. this is like a, a philosophy of, of, of the Western world. So it might be that they just weren't, that they were aware of it, but they didn't want to admit it. I think that could also happen, but apparently they were unaware of it anyway. In the experiment, maybe to just refer to that. So these two groups, there were there were like four stacks of cards, uh, A, B, C, D. A and B had bigger winnings, but also bigger losses. Like each time you drew a card, you would either win money or lose money. And mm -hmm. A and B had, you either won a lot of money or you lost a lot of money. And um, overall, if you continued playing A and B, you would lose. Like the overall math had you lose money through these mm. two, two stacks, whereas C and D had smaller gains, smaller losses. Mm. Um, but overall, you would win money. Mm. Um, and there are two kinds of two uh, ways you can read this experiment. And I actually am not sure which of these is more true. Reading A would be, oh, your unconscious figured it out. 
it did the math kind of and it knew oh these cards are not as good as these cards reading two would be the unconscious is actually built to react much more strongly to negative input mm -hmm. so it's not even about the math it's just about fuck me with those two i really got burned and i yeah, lost yeah. a lot so i'm never going to do that again i'm going to stick with these two which of these two meh who knows I mean, they're, they're, I'm sure that some people either have done or are planning a follow-up because that could easily be followed up with, a, with mm -hmm. other experiments which would clarify which of those two interpretations is, is more likely. Anyway, um, so the other thing I wanted to say uh, is that uh, I also recently read a book by some guy, I can't remember his name, but he, he also studies the subconscious mm -hmm. stuff and uh, it's called Gut Feelings. And his central idea in this book is that um, uh, is that a lot of the time when you have a gut feeling or when you have an unconscious sense of something, it's actually better than uh, doing something with with good reason or apparently good reasons. And um, this he he essentially goes some way to contradict. Now, this is something which I really picked up on maybe like something like 10 years ago or slightly less around 10 years ago maybe there, there was a really big wave of um of books and talk about uh how people are irrational the irrationality of people so uh there were books like steve uh, like thingy kahneman's book of course uh kahneman and tversky's book um thinking fast and slow was like at the center of this but there was also a bunch of other books. I mean, one very well-known one also by Dan Ariely is called um, Predictably Irrational. And I remember reading in Predictably Irrational uh, and occasionally being like, what? I mean, I was kind of skeptical of the whole, everyone seemed to want to pile on about irrationality and how bad it is. And I was like, firstly, you can't be fully rational because that doesn't make any, any sense for a living being. And, and secondly, um, uh, yeah, I thought like some of these irrational things might actually be good adaptive uh, behaviors there might be nothing wrong with with some of them so one example that dan Ariely gave is he gave the example of um if you go to have dinner with someone uh, at their house and you uh, and you're friends with them and you pay that is a really bad social faux pas uh, and he calls this a i can't remember his social norm or something like that versus a market norm i think that's what he calls it right market norm is if you go to say a restaurant and you pay or something then that that's different um, or if you pay when you, when you don't know someone very well. Um, now to me, I, I was like, this is clearly not irrational. Like, what are you talking about in this book about irrational? How is that irrational? Like, you know, ra I mean, at the rational level, you know, you, you, what you value in this relationship is, is the fact that you have a relationship with them and the amount of money that you're going to give them is minuscule compared to the value of like maintaining a relationship. In fact, being in their debt in some sense is going to strengthen your relationship, which is, probably rationally, you know, a, a utility maximization, if I'm going to use I mean, some economics it, words. Exactly. Right? If you look at it economically or even game theoretically, you're playing a completely different game. You, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you're, and you're in either case, if you're even at the level of psychopathy, right, then, then you're still probably better off like trying to cultivate that relationship than you are, um, than, than you are trying to like, for some reason, ruin it by trying to pay them. I mean, that just makes no, that just makes no rational sense, I'm, let alone I mean, irrational. And, and, I, and I love that point. Let's get back to that in the end, because I think it's a very similar um, question he raises in the end when he talks about unconscious goal setting. Like, mm. what's, what goals do we set? What paths of action do we take? Let me just continue going through these. All right, did you I have one, one more, more thing, point? One more <laughs> okay, thing, yeah. so, 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 so what I was saying is that there was this bunch of books that came out like 10 years ago. And, and mm -hmm. I, don't know if, I don't know if I can say everyone was talking about it, but I felt like there was a big movement to say, look how irrational people are. People are so terrible for being so irrational. Oh dear, you know, something like that. Um, and, and irrationality this, meaning you're acting according to these rules that you're not consciously thinking about. Yeah. No, no. Irrationality meaning if I, as a researcher slash economist slash game theorist slash person with common sense, right, if I come up with what is the optimal way of maximizing my utility under this scenario, and I compare that to the behavior of people, they're not behaving according to my analysis, what my analysis says the best behavior should be. <laughs> now, there, there, are some, there are some situations where that's true, 
or it, or at least it's it's pretty pretty like convincing enough let's say right but what i was thinking is like there are too many situations where they're just they're kind of assuming this and they're being too too dismissive of the you know make, like if these things have been around in humanity for a really long time we got to have really good reasons for dismissing them as like bad behaviors right it's, you it's, you it's also just... it's also such an interesting assumption to say i have this one model mm. so everything that doesn't uh, that doesn't fit this model is wrong like that number one that's a very interesting claim to make but yeah, but all too bold yeah but also saying i think there are there are also if we look at it as consciously if i say this is what i want then how do i get most of that and actually one of the things that um that this book also the adaptive unconscious would look at is saying we often don't even know what our unconscious needs are. We often don't even know what the things our unconscious is orienting towards are. Like, this is one of the main points also that a lot of the studies of asking people so high, uh, what is it you really care about in life? And then tracking their behavior often makes, they, they, they map up incredibly poorly. And then the question mm -hmm. is, do you actually care about the things you tell me you care about or do you care about the things you do every day? Wh which of them is it? Which of them do I value higher? Well, that, that squares quite well with the whole thing about how people are bad at predicting what makes them happy. They, they, they'll often engage in behaviors which, which, which undermine that or which don't provide them with more happiness, um, despite the fact that they claim that being happy is important to, to them. Uh, as yeah. well. So, um, yeah, so I, I just, I'm kind of finishing off that point. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, so like that, that stuff about, um, you know, irrationality is bad. And then this guy comes out and I was like, this, this has gone too far. And then this guy comes out with his book as well recently called gut feelings. Can't remember the guy's name, gut feelings. And he says, uh, firstly, he's sort of saying something that I felt a little bit vindicated by that. Like, yeah, like we can't just say people are, you know, that there's irrationality all over the place. We've got to be more careful than that. But then he goes on to describe the ways in which some of these gut feelings work. And he says that um, he gives one example that he gives several times and is quite memorable is the example of uh, the way people catch uh, flying objects, like a, like a baseball in a game of baseball. So um, uh, Richard Dawkins apparently is known for saying that people must be doing solving very complicated differential equations at some subconscious level because if you were to mathematically describe the flight of a ball you would use differential equations to do that and it's true I, I mean you know i did that at university right so so yeah you, you you know that is how you how you solve it analytically using a differential equation but he says you know when you actually study psychologically what people are doing when they're catching balls which people have done now um what that actually the rule that they're following is that they maintain the same angle between their eye and, and the ball. Right? They just try and maintain that angle. And this rule of thumb is enough to be like really, really good for catching balls. Um, so, you know, what's happening is that in theory, something really, there's like a really complex algorithm because it's a differential equation. Oh my God, the subconscious must be solving differential equations. But in practice, there's like a really, really simple rule of thumb that cuts straight through that differential equation. So like, that's like, um, that's like what you're saying now is that there's some really complex algorithm doing something, whoa, you know, on the, on the, the, the screen. But then, you know, the solution is probably they just go like, eh, I kind of like this one better, you know? <laughs> so it's something like super, super simple. Or like another example is the prisoner's dilemma. There's a kind of game you play with whether you cooperate with people or not. I'm not going to describe it in full detail, but basically it's a co cooperation or, or defection game. And it's, it, people have been uh, doing competitions of like everyone submit your, your favorite algorithm as to whether you're going to cooperate or not with this mm -hmm. other, other computer bot. And these bots sort of play the game together. Right? And, and the winning bot almost every single time in these competitions is one that just does tit for tat, which is like, if last time we spoke, you were nice to me, I'll be nice to you. And if last time you spoke, you were not nice to me, I'll be not nice to you. And, and you know, or, or very slight modifications on that algorithm. And you yeah, know, that, so but it, by now, by now, it's slight modifications on that algorithm. It's not just tit for tat anymore because people learned how to take advantage of tit for tat. But yeah, uh, yeah. still not complicated algorithms. No. So yeah, I mean, I guess what, what I'm coming down to is that I doubt that the subconscious is. I mean, I basically I believe the guy who wrote Gut Feelings that a lot of the stuff that subconscious does that looks super complicated might be simpler than it appears. I mean, yeah, that's that's exactly what these 
what basically these points um, I'm trying to just draw out are about. It's like, in a way, it is complex because it has to deal with a shitload of information. But mm. the way it does that is actually um, much easier to understand than if we try to do that with our mind and try to do that with our consciousness of like, oh, yeah, to do the ball, we have to get pi involved and then we have to do irrational numbers at the third level of uh, abstraction and like no you definitely need pi <laughs> <laughs> always pi <laughs> every time <laughs> yeah but um uh, just maybe one one more example that just occurs to me right now is um a teacher of consciousness actually who's who i find brilliant even though he's very much non-scientific he works uh more uh descriptive um is he has the example of when you walk walk in darkness and you have a flashlight if you think about it consciously you, you would imagine the best way to use your flashlight is to point right in front of you so that you can place your feet but actually the best way to use the flashlight is to point like five meters ahead of you and the rest just happens automatically your feet are automatically placed. So yeah. this idea of, oh, I have to really check where I put my feet is the worst strategy you have. Whereas, oh, I see the path and my feet are just doing their thing is actually much more, um, much more realistic and much more uh, powerful. That's very insightful. I mean, it's probably something at the level of your by by exposing yourself to more information your subconscious can handle it for you by building a model building a, a map of your surroundings without you having to think about it very much yeah but yeah. but that i mean i've i've really tried that because there were times when i was kind of like <laughs> sitting in the forest for a month meditating and i had all all sorts of time for uh, doing these kind of experiments so if i had to go pee at night and i needed a flashlight i would i would try out these things of like putting the flashlight right in front of my feet and it's so disturbing because it's it's like it's so stressful because there's like oh no i have to put my foot there. I, I was fascinated by that small experiment yeah yeah but let's let's continue mm -hmm. so so we had we were just with um whoop. One of the things the unconscious does is pattern recognition. It mm -hmm. learns to uh, recognize patterns. The next thing uh, Timothy Wilson says the unconscious does is it, uh, it um, filters what's happening and makes sure like, what do I pay attention to? So what, it, what is it? It selects things to pay attention to. It selects things that it finds important and it, guides our attention. And the example he gives for that is the cocktail party effect. You're talking to one person, the rest of the, co of the whole room is going blah, 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 and you don't really hear anything because you're talking to that one person, your attention is fixated on them. But then somebody 20 meters away mentions your name and you hear it. So he says, subconsciously, you must have been filtering all the different things that were being said to some degree saying it's not important but then when when the name is there boom you, you i had that experience today you like this morning this morning bam. yeah this, this morning i, I was uh, i was sitting in the in this library um and, and reading a book and then someone um the lady that is this very small little library it's only got like two rooms in it and I was the only one there, except for these, these ladies at the front who were kind of uh, working there. And, and they were talking in, in Chinese and like, uh, presuming that I you know, wasn't listening and they were, and I, I wasn't really listening until they started mentioning their periods. <laughs> I don't know, it's like, I like it just distracted me. <laughs> it's like, I was leaving, I'll go to the other room. <laughs> so I was like, I don't, that's not, you know, it, it was like, it was like blah 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 blah, and then my period, and I was around. Like, oh, that that's enough. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> Bless them that they're yeah. talking about that and that they. But that's fine. They can talk about it all they want, but you know, but it was like it, I guess it was a word that my that my unconsciousness picked up, and I was like, right, not not and, what I'm not what and, I'm here for. And then also, once your attention is on that, how difficult is it to get it away from that again? Yeah, like it's just yeah. again we're with unconscious processes. Like attention is focused on that now. And to even mm. try to get it back to reading and getting back to all of that is just background noise. Mm -hmm. Woo. Not that easy to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, when they say words like foreigner, at another point they said foreigner, and I was like, well, what are they going to say? <laughs> <laughs> say exactly the same thing. Anyway. Yeah. So, so that would be, so we're, we're, the unconscious is detecting patterns. It's filtering information to make sure like what do we pay attention to and what even comes to consciousness the next level would be its interpretation what's happening it's interpreting what's happening so so a lot of our even conscious thoughts are coming from unconscious interpretations of the environment and the example he gives for that in the book are two like one is a personal example he had where his uh, her his wife told him Oh, at these school meetings, there's this guy named Phil, and he's always annoying. And he goes to the school meeting, and sure, there's this guy Phil, and he's doing all these annoying things. And then he mm. comes home to her, and he's like, "Yeah, that Phil, <clears throat> he's a handful." And his wife is like, "Oh, I didn't, I didn't say Phil is annoying. I said Bill is annoying." And then he has to rethink his whole story he had, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I perceived all of these things that Bill did." Uh, that filled it that I actually do too as annoying because I had this assumption of him being annoying. Mm. So he just goes through that. And another example is uh, there are famous priming examples of priming people with, um, with subconscious words like aggressive, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then just telling them a really simple story of this guy, Donald and something really, uh, Simply, he does. It's like a salesperson came to his door and Donald didn't open the door. And depending on if people had been primed with words towards aggression, rude, all of that, they would interpret that as rude and aggressive. Whereas if they had been primed with careful, nice, uh, thoughtful, they looked at it as, oh, he's just taking care of himself. They would mm. fundamentally interpret the situations differently based on mm. subconscious information. Anything you want to add to that? I think this is pretty... That, no, that, that's, that, that makes complete sense, yeah. The next point he makes is uh, we interpret, uh, we evaluate all these things. So we've found patterns, we've interpreted these patterns, what do they mean? And then we'll get evaluations from that as feelings. So basically, this will tell us, oh, this means better get angry. This means back off. So a lot of the communication and the evaluation of what we get are kind of feeling senses. And this is actually where he uses that card uh, example with the four decks you've mentioned. Because mm. um, the physiological measurements of these people show that they had quite strong somatic responses to the different card decks um, that mm. they weren't aware of, but they, their body f very quickly had somatic responses of fear to, um, to the card decks that uh, had the big loss, big win thing. Mm. And, um, and no, no fear <laughs> with the other two. So mm. that a lot of the communication is then more somatic rather than, oh, this is the better card deck because blah 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 like it's more of a mm -hmm. gut feeling as you as, mm -hmm. as you might have used it and the last one is that the unconscious also chooses goals by prioritizing options and a lot of this happens unconsciously so the example he gives to this is you're playing tennis with somebody how hard do you try because you may have a level of tennis mastery that's pretty high but if you play with somebody who's not that good will you use all of your skill 
Probably not because that wouldn't be fun. But do you ever consciously set that as a goal for yourself? Like, oh, I will, I will play really soft today. Or is it more that you have just unconsciously chosen that path based on mm. what, what, the, what the probable results of it are? And this again connects to what you, I think, were talking about with um, rationality, that we may not always choose the most rational, but we always prioritize options, and that a lot of that happens through the unconscious. Um, so the, the three that you just outlined, um, there was one about in interpretation, there was one about evaluation, am I using the right word? Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was one about prioritizing options. So mm -hmm. the interpretation and evaluation, I'm uh, super, super on, on board with. I think we may have, we at least partly have already discussed mm -hmm. that before, uh, all about how, um, uh, all about how your, your perception is dependent on, on previous experience and, and things like that. So um, that I'm just like 100% on board with and I think it's, it's fine. Um, the thing about prioritizing options, that's something where I, I know the least, uh, I'm least clear about. The, exa the tennis example I don't find to be a, such a strong example. I mean... I, I think that's the weakest point in, he, in his, is that goal setting. For me, that goal setting makes a lot more sense when I think about it as um, in stress situations or in similar situations that we have behavior that automatically happens, mm. which is, which, I mean, we never set that intention of, I'm going to run away from this car. I'm going to get out of the way, but it just mm. happens. If we mm. think about that consciously, again, we have to say there must have been an intention in that, but it never mm. came about um, through thought. It was just there. Yeah. Um, it's something I don't know what, how I can add to it though, but it's definitely the thing about uh, about intentions. I mean, there's a there's a really big sidetrack I could easily get into, so I'd rather I'd rather wait until I'd rather wait until the end, and if we have time, I'll have a big sidetrack on that uh, that's inspired by this options thing. Um, I mean, go go into that sidetrack now because I'm. Um, these are kind of his five points of what the adaptive unconscious does are these. Okay. So okay. we recognize patterns, we filter where we put our attention and what's important. We interpret mm. it, we evaluate it mostly through somatic and feeling markers. And then we unconsciously choose options or um, set goals. Mm. And that's so basically he makes these five points. we also with an expression of, a lot of these we usually ascribe to consciousness, but our adaptive mm. unconscious can actually do all of them in a way that, that is actually sufficient for many, many different situations where we mm. don't have to consciously set a goal, where we don't have to consciously think about things. We, we evaluate, interpret automatically. Um, so, okay, if I, if, cause it might be that you have like lots more to say and I don't want to take the time up. I mean, no? okay. I'm happy to also have, a, have another conversation. I would rather get clear yeah. on the basics because I think... Yeah, so basically the, the angle from which I'm looking at it is what I'm going to talk about. There's, um, I, I believe you've heard me talk about this a little bit before, but we haven't actually had a conversation about it. Um, it's like different types of uh, explanation or different types of theory. So um, to, uh, this is... Um, uh, you can think of this as different ways of representing knowledge or a, a philosophical word for it would be different ontologies. So um, uh, you can understand things in a mechanistic way or in a, um, a nomological way. A mechanistic way would be to understand, you know, X causes Y causes Z, uh, cause and effect kind of chains where you think of things as like linked together and how does this make this happen? How does this make this happen? You, you, it's kind of like you're, you're trying to understand a mechanism, right? It's what's called mechanistic. Um, whereas nomological is saying something like, well, there's a fundamental principle. You know, it's like a bird flying way, way, uh, like a hundred, whatever they call it, a hundred mile view or something. I don't know, something like that. But, you know, like a kind of bird's eye view of like, well, it doesn't really matter even what the details are 
obviously this is going to be the result because there's this fundamental force that's driving this or there's this fundamental requirement for how things have to go so um i mean on one level when you talk about that i start to think about how how much uh because I, i'm 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 basically comparing this against something else which i've been aware of for a really long time but recently taken more seriously is uh, rational choice theory so that's something from economics and game theory and i've mainly heard about how it, what its weaknesses are and that's a lot of that's been from cognitive science and it's true it has weaknesses but then i've recently been reading people um particularly economists which is a weird thing for me to read but i've been <laughs> reading them and i don't usually read that kind of thing um but they um they make a very good case for a number of situations where people actually um form for example uh, governance type institutions for example in prisons prison gangs, the way that prison gangs, in, specifically in the, in the United States, in California in particular, the way that prison gangs, gangs are organized, they're organized in such a way as to actually bring them in an almost utilitarian way. They, act, they effectively act as a government inside, uh, inside the, the prison in a way that actually reduces violence, uh, increases the benefits to, gang, to uh, actually all the inmates, but particularly gang members. So, you know, I'm not saying gangs are wonderful and we all need to join one, but what I'm saying is that what, what's happened in that situation is that under the pressure of certain needs, certain, certain institutions have been set up, mm -hmm. uh, which, are, which are like rationally good for these people. So that's like a really sort of non-logical view on why people might do things. Um, and and I'm sort of thinking, also, you know... But you could also look at these prison gangs from a very mechanistic point of view, like you get into prison, you have this experience. This experience mm. leads you to... Uh, this dilemma this dilemma mm. then has you make that choice so you can kind of look at it as a, exactly as a, this leads well, to that way well this is this is kind of how this onto ontology works right ontology is is one way of describing what ontology is is the study of like what is real um so at one level both of those things are real at one level you know it's real that um there is some fundamental you know these people need protection from violence they're going to produce something that protects them from violence right that that's real but at another level it's real that like they have these day-to-day -day in just micro interactions which will lead to the development of some such institution right um i was also reading about pirates in a similar similar vein pirates also their, their governance was also based on a need to well try not to, to try not to die or get captured and uh, try and make as much money as possible as fast as possible and they ended up making really weird things like democracy like <laughs> what like democracy on pirate ships but it's true you know because it was good for making them more money and, and stuff so anyway whatever long story that i don't want to get into but what i'm saying is like i'm not saying that i have this is one of the reasons why it's a long discussion or a long thread i'm not saying that i have an answer i'm saying that i have a perspective that i'm thinking about this goal stuff as like how much should we think about it mechanistically like x leads to y leads to z and how much should we think about it nomologically like you know these are the goals because of course they should have this goal because there's some fundamental reason why this goal is like inbuilt or, or something you know like how much should, should we be looking at it one way or the other way or like you know that, that's kind of an angle which i would like to think about this from although i'm sure that that could easily be a very long conversation so, so basically your question of should we think about goal setting uh mechanistically or nomologically yeah well obviously i don't intend it to be a black and white thing you know i'm not saying like if we think about it nomologically you're not allowed to think about it mechanistically you know not like that but but to some extent like which which, which perspective are we more going to find useful or under what conditions should we look at one or the other kind of this, this kind of perspective yeah do you have an example of how to think of goal setting mechanistically and how to think of it nomologically right now yeah, 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 yeah. So, so nomologically would be something like, um, uh, so I think economists are like typical nomological thinkers in, in this regard, right? So uh, nomological answers to questions are time-free, whereas mechanistic answers to questions are time-based, right? So, um, so a time-free answer is like, you know, um, they're going to change their behavior to get more of, I'm going to, I'm going to say money. I'm just going to throw that out there. I mean, I'm not, you know, whatever. It's just an example. They're going to change their behavior to get more money because they, that's what they want. Right. And then it doesn't say exactly how it's going to happen, but it explains like somebody changed their behavior to do that. It could, it could be something other than money. Of course, it could be they change their behavior to whatever to like, <clears throat> uh, 
to improve their relation with someone, whatever it is, right? But like they, they change the behavior to do that, right? And when you observe that happened and you go like, um, of course, you know, and here are their limitations. They can't do X, they can't do Y because they're constrained. So they end up taking this path. It's a really good idea. And of course they did it. You know, that's basically all rational choice theory is. It's like people end up make, making really good decisions a lot of the time because it's in their best interest. And you know, their best interest is something that we can observe. Like, yeah, that's, that's a force that's gonna push them in that direction because they have this benefit and it has low costs or, or, or whatever, right? So that's a very normal logical view. It doesn't say how they're gonna arrive at the decision. It doesn't say like, what are the individual detailed steps? It just says that's gonna happen because there's this benefit and there's low cost, right? Or this other thing is not gonna happen because despite this benefit, there's a huge cost, right? So it's just, it, it, it says- actually, actually, if we look at it from, from the unconscious, we could on one level, for instance, say it will make the choices that will uh, keep the person safe and meet most of its needs, most of, most right. of their needs. Okay. That would be a, much, a very much more nomological view of what the goal setting thing is like. Whereas a mechanistic view would be like, okay, so inside your goal setting mind, whatever that is, right? Then you've got like structure A and structure B and structure C, right? And they're called, you know, we can name them, whatever they're called. They're called the hammer and the, the, you know, the, the hammer hammock, and the candle. The hammer, the hammock and the hammer. Yeah, okay, fine, right? And then the hammer hits the hammock and then the hammock like, you know, takes the hammer's ideas and puts them in the hammer and then the hammer goes and asks the hammer what to do and then, you know, it's so like that whole story, that whole story, it, I mean, you know, that's obviously absurd, but like the whole story of like this does this, basically the chimp model is mechanistic. And the chimp model says, this is how it works. This talks to this, which talks to this, which talks to this, and then this happens. That's, it's, it's a process in time. It doesn't say you know, there's a fundamental principle. It says there's a, there's a set of structures and they talk to each other in this way and then there's this as a result that happens because of those structures talking to each other. If you were gonna talk about, I mean, I was just giving an example from like sort of an economics point of view. If you were gonna talk about economics in a in mechanistic way, you would say, well, you know. Um, there's this customer uh, the, and there's this uh, business and. Yeah, and then they talk to the customer, and then the customer wasn't happy. So then they change the thing, and then blah, blah, blah. Right, okay, that, that's a mechanistic story, right? Which it's, mechanistic basically is kind of like storytelling. Like, are you telling a story of this happens, and then this happens, and this happens? Whereas nomological is like rule setting. It's like there's this rule and this rule. So in order to follow these rules, this must be the answer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, those, those are the two perspectives that you could have. So let me, I have about five more minutes. Let me, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually really like that discussion. I think it's an important one. I would just try to get, go one step further with my notes right now, because mm -hmm. um, I think this is a potentially, uh, this, I think this connects to it. So the next question, and, and this is not, the question he asks in the book as explicitly, but this is kind of the question he answers, is how does the adaptive unconscious decide what is happening? How does it decide what to select and put attention to? How does it in, uh, decide how to interpret things, how to evaluate things, what goals to set in motion? So this would be in one way a mechanistic question, but I think he answers it actually incredibly nomologically. Mm -hmm. He says there are two... Um, two conflicting kind of orientations, which is one, accuracy. We need yeah. to be as accurate as possible so we actually survive. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. if we inaccurately um, display the world, then it's like, oh, I'm gonna go to the apple tree and get an apple, but I miss it by a mile. Oops. Mm. Um, mm. And the other one is coherence. Mm. I'm actually, I actually have a lot of my um, psychic structures in place to to keep a coherence of myself and worldview. And I will actually reject things that um, endanger that coherence. The co word coherence is not his, but I actually think it's a better word than he uses. Um, and these can, work in, these can work in concert, like it can be accurate and coherent at once, and these can be um, at odds with each other. Mm. And um, the goals of, both uh, and the basic goals of the adaptive unconscious are 
to make sure we're safe and we have attachment or relationships to make sure we are coherent and that we procreate. Basically, he doesn't name these ex as explicitly, but all the examples he uses come to these three points. Mm. So I think this would be a nomological way to try yes. to answer these questions. It is, it is, it is, yeah. So basically, Actually, yeah. I mean, the, this thing, accuracy and coherence is excellent, uh, wonderful uh, example or idea. I mean, because this is, this is what, um, this is kind of how science works, <laughs> right? Science tries to be both coherent and accurate. Um, and then, you know, that there's, um, uh, do you know, you know, like um, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific mm -hmm. Revolutions? Yeah. So like, that's kind of like you, you, you try and be accurate, you end up with a system that that's coherent if it's inaccurate sometimes it's okay because you know if it's really coherent you're like well i'll stick with the coherence and then if it's like inaccurate too much of the time you end up with a scientific revolution you have to you, there's like another theory that is also coherent but is but can adopt the can deal with the, the previous inaccuracies like that, that that's that's one thing um this is actually also that there have been a bunch of things in this um as we've been speaking that have reminded me of uh, machine learning so mm -hmm. Uh, I've I've worked a bit in machine learning, um, and uh, and and obviously I, I know I know a, a fair bit. You know I have quite a lot of interest in in, in human learning, and um, oh. and it, it's yeah and there's you know obviously it's hardly it's hardly like they're uh, identical or anything, but there are occasional overlaps, and um, and here th this idea of coherence versus accuracy is. I think related to something called the bias variance trade-off, which is partly a machine learning and partly a statistics idea um, about, it's essentially a mathematical idea, um, bias, bias variance trade-off. So sometimes you can uh, calculate statistics in such a way that they are more likely to, they are closer to correct, but they are biased. So what this means is that like when you when you calculate like what is the average averages is not a terrible terribly good example with uh, but I'll go with averages what is the average uh, you know height of people and you have like a sample of the population then you can like there might be more in the case of averages that isn't but it's true of things like standard deviation it, it, like um, you, you could calculate the average say you could calculate the average in two different ways then one way might be uh, if you calculate the average that way. Uh, like a billion times, then um, on then on average you would be correct, right? That that means it has no bias, right? But also it could have um, high variance, which means when you calculate the average, you actually, on general, in gen generally speaking, you're going to be far away from from the, the right answer. So like, perhaps it's easier to talk about this in terms of a dartboard. So imagine you're throwing darts at a dartboard, uh, and um, something with low variance but high bias would be like you always hit the same spot. And it's kind of close to the bullseye, but it's not the bullseye. Mm -hmm. So you're always really accurate, but you're also off, always, like you're off, that's called bias. Like you're wrong, right? That's inaccuracy, but it's highly coherent. So you're always hitting the same place, right? But, um, but then something that would be um, incoherent, but accurate would be like, on average, like if you get all of your darts, and average their position, their average position is a bullseye, but you're hitting all over the place. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that that's this this um the level of how fundamental this is it goes all the way down to maths, right? Which is like that's more fundamental than physics, you know? That's like super fundamental. So like that that it's interesting that there's a connection there with something so incredibly deep, um, the mm -hmm. bias variance trade off. Yeah. Yeah, and I have to leave in a moment. I just want to finish my last point for today because i think this mm. could be a great place also for future thought and for our next conversation which is according to wilson the fundamental method the adaptive unconscious works is accessibility it will always choose what's most accessible in it as the first answer to things which is also where biases and heuristics and all of that come in and that we have accessibility based on our life experience. We have accessi accessibility 
based on uh, chronic accessibility. Mm -hmm. So we have certain things that, things that are always accessible to us. So we always see the world like that. And this would be then the question of, can we, for instance, through conscious thinking and also conscious kind of creating new experience in our life, can we change what's accessible to us? And can we change our patterns of accessibility? But those would be just points that I think could be really interesting. Also, this, I think this would have been actually the place to now dive into learning again. Like, mm -hmm. is learning changing our accessibility? And how does this relate to, um, whoop, to coherence? How does this relate to accuracy? I think these are actually quite fundamental, deep questions, especially if we then look at um, what is accuracy for pattern recognition? What is accuracy for uh, attention selection? What is coherence for these things? Mm. Well, I mean, <clears throat> funnily enough, uh, there, there may be some some insights of that directly from actual statistics, which is a pretty, in a way it's pretty far away, but in a way it's like kind of exactly what this is about. I mean, statistics is a mathematical study of gaining insights from data. So, you know, that, that's partly why the biosphere and straight off is relevant to coherence and, and um, uh, what was the other one? Correctness. Uh, accuracy. I, so yeah, coherence and accuracy, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would love to dive deeper into these questions. Also, I am fascinated by the, by the more mathematical and economical perspectives on this. Like that mm -hmm. actually seems to bring a completely different level of understanding. Yeah, and completely guess, different angles, yeah. Yeah, but this is kind of my current trying to assimilate this, um, this, model of the adaptive unconscious and get a good grasp on what does it actually explain and how does it relate to things because i think the the main problem i have with the computer is that in its mechanistic perspective it completely underestimates the unconscious and i actually think there is so much of what's in our computer that has been put there by the computer itself and that actually yeah. it's in there in a different language then the human or the chimp speak and to change it and to um, transform these programs that are in there um, th through implicit learning, we actually have to kind of translate them first. We have to even translate them to get to know what's in our computer because, of, because like most of it has gotten there through these implicit ways of learning patterns, of mm -hmm. seeing which ones to pay attention to, of um, connecting them automatically through certain to certain feelings and reactions and then having certain automatic goals or intentions connected to it. I would actually say many of the things we have learned and many of the things that are creating issues in our life uh, have been implicitly learned. And this is where I, where I just think it's so different to that it's been put in there by the human or by the chimp model. Mm. I think it's Mm. That's where I have such a fundamental problem with it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, examples abound. Language is, is, is an obvious case. First language is, is not, is, is essentially learned subconsciously. Yeah. Oh, and now we could have dive, dove into all of the things you said in the beginning of like heuristics and biases, priming, self-affirmation theory. Like, I think all of that could, we could now look at in a lot more detail, but unfortunately... Maybe next time. Maybe yeah. next time, yeah. I would, I would really enjoy that. You never, you never know what's around.